All right, welcome to today's webinar, uh, wherever and whenever you may be joining us. Uh, my name is Spencer Kesey. I'm a research and education specialist at the QOI, and we're thrilled to be bringing you um, a new webinar series. This is our basic webinar series, creating close communities while at a distance. Um, this is the first of three in a series uh, that are occurring on July 8th, July 16th, and August 5th. Um, each one of these sessions will have a different topic uh, connected to creating close communities while at a distance and a different scenario that goes along with that. Um, before we get started, I want to just do a quick ch tech check with our audience, um, our, our live audience. If you could um, to let me know that you are seeing um, multiple speakers on webcam, you should be seeing Katie and Claudia on webcam. If you're in the gallery view of Zoom, you should be seeing a PowerPoint deck slide up. If you're seeing that, if you're seeing our presenters, if you're hearing my voice, if you could just hit the raise hand function, that would just show that you're here at 10 of it. We have a very engaged audience. Katie, Claudia, we have a very engaged audience today. That's nice. excellent. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, two ways that you can interact as an audience member on today's webinar. Uh, we have the Q&A tab. That's a great place for you to submit questions that may come, come up over the course of our session. Um, Katie is going to be serving as our moderator today and will be calling on those questions and um, integrating those into our talk today. Uh, so look for those. Also, you've got the, the internal chat for this session. So feel free to chat it up with our speakers, um, with our other attendees. We've got a great group of folks in here today. Um, so thank you for joining us. If you're joining us uh, on a recorded version of this, thank you so much for watching this recording on our KUI YouTube channel. And remember, this is the first in a series of three on creating close communities while at a distance. Um, I'm going to now throw it over to Claudia and Katie to introduce themselves and introduce our topic. All right, thank you so much, Spencer, and thanks to everybody who tuned in today. Uh, my name is Claudia Beanie, and I am here today with Katie. Katie's actually going to, I'm going to be the, the vast majority of the presenting uh, today, and Katie will be the next one up in the second series, and then Dee in the third. So um, to jump right in, we are, we rewrote BASIC 2.0 about, how long ago was that, Katie? Oh, three years ago, I think it was, about three years ago. And so what I want to do today is we're going to spend the first maybe 10 minutes, just giving you some background about the basic model. Then the next 20 minutes, we'll probably spend doing analysis of the company that we're looking at this time around, which is Jeep. And then the third section will be the application. So what does this look like? What does this mean to you who are running residence halls, supervising staff, who are trying to build community, even though we have proximity as a limitation, if you will. Uh, and then the last block of time is, of course, the Q&A. And I value that uh, incredibly, because that's where you really get to tailor your, um, you get to get answers to your specific needs. So you'll tailor those to what it is that you most specifically are thinking about. Okay, uh, so for the purpose, of the, really, I think that the purpose of today is just to begin to loosen up your thinking about how we build community when we don't have some of the standard things that we've always had in our toolbox, most of it being proximity to the students with whom we are building community. We're going to be under constraints, smaller group sizes, maybe even some students not on campus. So it's just a completely different look and feel. Uh, so really that is the purpose of today, just kind of to loosen your wheels up and get you thinking about, no pun intended, and get you thinking about how to do that. So to do it, we're gonna use a case study, as we've mentioned, and we're gonna look into Jeep as a company. Uh, how do they actually build community? How do they have such a strong, if you will, sense of identity and connection among Jeep owners? And how do they do it even though they don't share space? So um, before we jump into that, one of the things that I love about the fact that we're doing this in three part series is that we're using case studies of real life businesses and companies. And in fact, one of the things that we say all the time, one of the biggest strengths of the basic model is that it isn't just a programming model. It isn't designed exclusively for residence hall uh, leaders, if you will. It is a leadership model that transcends their college experience. So what we believe we're doing is actually building leaders who will be successful long after they graduate as a result of the tools 
the skills, the competencies that they acquire through the basic model. So first, let's start by doing some just brief overview of the basic model, assuming that some of you are relatively new to it. When we wrote this, and this is over 20 years old now, but when we wrote the original version of it, we actually were writing it because up to that point, most college campuses and every campus I ever worked on was working with a programming model. So you would you know, kind of be required to fulfill programming initiatives in maybe seven or eight categories. And so we all got very proficient, and I'm sure that you, you know, similar things are happening now. We all got very proficient at how to plan programs and then how to lure students out of their room to come to them. Uh, free food, whatever the mechanism might be. We just decided that we could do better if, in fact, rather than focusing exclusively on checking the boxes of programs, we actually could build a model that was focused on how do you build a community so that students want to be engaged and want to be involved in, their, in, in, in the community that you've got. And so that's really, for 20 years, we moved along with that model. And when we rewrote it again, so basic 2.0, the one that we're talking about here today, when we did it again this third time, we said, we actually think we can do even better than that. We really believe that at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're building strong leaders. Because when leaders are strong, they inevitably will build community. So if we can focus on the leadership, we know that we'll get community, which in turn will lead to programming. And in the process, we're creating very much what we would consider to be an internship in leadership. We think the RA position is kind of the ultimate leadership internship, uh, making the residence hall floor or building actually the laboratory where all of the actual work is done. So our model consists of three major components. The first one is the cycle of community. And this is just our acknowledgement that whether it's on a college campus or in the neighborhood that you live in or some other community-based organization that you're a part of, basically this is the nuts and bolts of how community even happens, the anatomy, if you will, of how community happens. It begins with knowing one another's names and then slowly stacking conversations, information that you're gleaning about one another, uh, stacking that information. And then mapping assets and discovering DEAs, which is just to say I'm stacking conversations about who you are, what you care about, what you desire in life, information about you, uh, experiences that you want to have but haven't had yet. I'm logging all of that in my mind. And then eventually we're moving to the place where we're making matches. So I know that Katie wants to get better at X and Sally is good at Y. And so I'm going to put those two people together. And then eventually tapping assets. So getting a really good handle on who on my floor is good at what, in what ways can they contribute to the building, to the floor, to the community, and then tapping into them for that reason. Because we know, and you probably agree, that to the extent that we can engage you in the community itself, the more we actually engage you in the building of it, the more invested you will become in it. And then the sixth piece, the filling gaps, is just an acknowledgement that even in the most thriving of communities, there are oftentimes gaps, uh, pieces of information, experiences or expertise that are necessary, but that can't necessarily be filled by someone within the community. So sometimes we have to go outside of that community and access a resource on campus or even in the outside surrounding uh, community, if you will. So that model, works no matter what community we're in or how big or how small it is. So that's the beauty of that. And that sits at the center. At the end of the day, most everything else that we're doing in the basic model is attempting to um, leverage or bring this to life. Okay, so the second piece of it is really the touch points. So the model comes with a supervisor's guide. And in that supervisor's guide are really all of these six touch points that we believe supervisors have access to. So one of the pieces that we reference in the basic model is involvement in learning. And it talks about the fact that for people to learn, there need to be three things that are present. One needs to be feedback, two is involvement, and three is high standards. So this entire section right here is really responding to how do we give our staff feedback 
on an ongoing and regular basis about the work that they're doing and the community that they're building. So these touch points, the supervisor's guide addresses all of them and talks about how to use them constructively to build leaders and to help build community. So obviously you can see what they are, summer and winter training, weekly staff meetings, one-on-ones, weekly reports, the end of the year staff evaluation, and the rehire process. These are all opportunities that we have to touch our RA staff or our staff and, and in turn develop them as leaders. Um, the thing I was gonna say about this is that one of the prizes inside, if you will, of this particular piece is that what we've learned over time is that it really also helps answer the question about what it means to be a good supervisor. We realize that sometimes in our graduate preparation programs, we kind of skim over that, not necessarily talking about how to formally supervise or how to um, provide uh, useful feedback. So all of these things really help define the supervisor role. Okay, the third piece that I just want to talk about are the challenge cards. So we've talked about that model, the, the, the community building model that transcends all communities. We've talked about touch points. And this is really where the model comes alive. So once we teach you the basics of what it means and how you even build community, then the question is, okay, great, then what? So this deck of cards that we've created, the original deck and then a booster pack of 15 more, is really set up as you see. So we've taken skills and competencies that we know the workplace, the workforce is looking for in, the, in future graduates. And so we've taken those concepts and then we've attached to them a short story that helps explain it and a weekly challenge that will really get you applying it to your community. Now the beauty of this, of course, is that no two staff members will apply it in exactly the same way because no two communities look exactly the same or have the same dynamic going on at a time. So the most important thing to know as it relates to this is that the model comes down to these 30 cards that we've included in it, each one reflecting a different skill or competencies, competency that an employer is looking for in a graduate. And then we explain it and we give a challenge that requires them to actually experiment with the concept. All along the while, they are gathering what we would refer to as artifacts, and at the end of the day, being able to build what we think is a leadership portfolio that helps them when they graduate. Okay, that's just a little bit about the model itself so that you can see how it is that this actually all comes to be. The next thing that we want to talk about is the, there are two underlying concepts that really undergird today's conversation. So there's more theory that undergirds the entire model itself, but there are two things that I want to talk about just that are central to understanding uh, today's conversation. So the first is Behavior is a function of person times environment. This is central to the basic model. It essentially just acknowledges that whatever the behavior is that we're most wanting or warranting uh, is a function of who the student or who the person is and the environment that we're creating for them. So why this is so relevant to today's conversation is because the E in this equation has been significantly impacted by COVID-19. We might all agree that the behavior that we're looking for is still an engaged, involved community where people are interacting and building camaraderie and friendship and all of that. So that might be the desired behavior, but that behavior, again, is a function of the person times the environment. So the person might even have remained the same, but the environment itself has changed drastically. So this equation will become more important as we uh, move through the rest of today's conversation, but it's certainly central to understanding uh, why we're even here today. The second is the community connection model. Uh, this is something that I developed when I was working at a university many years ago in Louisville, Kentucky. I was challenged with basically understanding the student experience 
um, at that particular university. And so we underwent a study trying to really understand, again, the student experience. And what came out of it was this community connection model. And what we learned most from that experience was that our ability to build connection to community was basically reliant on these two variables, time running along the bottom and intensity running along the top. So if we could, uh, if you, if you want to say, if we could control for these two variables, we could impact how connected a person felt to the community. So let me give you some examples. If an interaction was short, an hour, let's say a floor program or whatever that might be, and the intensity of it was low, meaning and intensity is actually defined by the amount of physical energy and psychological energy that I exert. So if the time was short and the intensity was low, I was just sitting there listening and receiving without any interaction whatsoever, then the connection that I would build would be minimal. If in fact the experience lasted a longer period of time, let's just even call it the academic year, and the intensity was low, the sheer repeat nature of it would actually impact uh, at a greater level my sense of connection because I'm continuing to do it time and time again, and each time I do it, I get a little more familiar, more comfortable, or more connected. Then we move up to here where we might say, well, it's a short period of time, but the intensity is high. And this could be most characterized, certainly on college campuses, by if you were to think about um, retreats that you might take, or an alternative spring break, where it lasts a finite amount of time, but the amount of physical energy that students are exerting, or the amount of psychological energy, the amount of, they're having to think about it, is so high, they're being very vulnerable, they're sharing with one another, it's so high that that can create a real sense of connection in a very short period of time. And then the last quadrant is about what happens when it's a long period of time and the intensity is fairly high. This would be most indicative or most reflective of, let's say, well, the RA position, to be honest with you. This has the great potential to create a deep sense of connection for student leaders on a college campus. Because if they do that job well, they're doing it for a year or more, and it's a pretty intense experience where they're giving a lot of physical energy and a lot of psychological energy. This could also be other leadership positions on campus. So that's that community connection model. This is going to become really important as we do a little analysis about, um, about G. So let's jump into the case study right now. Uh, today we're going to take a deep dive into, the, into Jeeps. Now let me back up and tell you a little fun story about Jeep. I'm married to a man who has had six Jeeps in the last 20 years. He loves Jeeps. We've got a lot of them. And, uh, and I, so I didn't know anything about Jeeps. Um, I liked it fine, but he is a big Jeep guy. So they're about, I'm going to say six years ago, we drop our boys off to school at the same time. So we go together, we drive together, we drop them off, we come home, and then we both go our separate ways and we go to work. But we go in his Jeep. So it's a two lane road on the way to and from school. So what I would notice is, of course, I already had become aware that there's such a thing as a Jeep wave, um, which no one tells you about. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but people in Jeep, Jeeps wave, which is one of the reasons I was so excited to do today's webinar, because I've often thought to myself, Jeep has figured out how to build a sense of camaraderie and build a sense of connection among Jeep drivers, and they never talk, they only ever wave. And I was always, I've always been fascinated by it because of course I've always been fascinated by the concept of community. So I've really thought, I want to do a deep dive and really understand a little bit more about what makes that happen. So being able to do this today is really great for me. But going back to that drive every single morning, back and forth, back and forth, of course, Richard would always do the Jeep wave to anybody who passed. But there was one Jeep that we would pass every morning, and it was a friend of ours, and she never waved, never waved. And so one day we were all somewhere, maybe at dinner, and he said, what's up with you? Like, you never wave, and I wave at you every morning. 
Well, she didn't know about the Jeep wave and she's kind of like, oh, my head's in the clouds. I'm just not thinking about it. I'm not focused. And um, so they kind of went on their way. He's like, listen, it's rude. Like when, when somebody waves at you, when you're in a Jeep and somebody waves at you, you got to wave back. It's rude. So then he would do it a little bit more. So I don't know. I'm going to say two days later, we had come home from dropping the boys off at school. And in our driveway is our friend in her Jeep. And she's hanging something on our doorknob. And it was a big, I want you to picture like, in the state in a stadium you would see a big phone number one it was like a big finger right and so she hung it on the doorway and said okay now i'll never forget so i put that in richard's jeep my husband and then every morning when i like knew i could see her coming because we are on a different schedule so we're going this way while he's going this or she's coming this way i would put on the thing and i'd wave it over you know out of the jeep and i'd wave at her so she would definitely not forget to wave back so my point in telling you that silly little story is just to say that all of that fun, that connection that, that created the laughter, the friendship, the fun, all of that really emanated from this very simple thing that Jeep has going for it. So it's just one more example of kind of the fun, if you will, that can happen. So let's talk about why this is, why does this work? What is the anatomy of Jeep and community? And what is it about this that makes this whole thing work? I want to do it through three lenses, if you will. So I want to do the analysis through three different things that I want to look at. The first one is a piece of our basic model. So woven throughout our model, you will see us reference these six eyes um, that date way back to 1998 but they work. So I want to look at it through the lens of Jeep right now. So the first one is, of course, introduction. Now, what's really interesting about this is that as it relates at least to the Jeep wave, there is no formal introduction. It is not like when you buy a Jeep, anybody says to you as you're pulling off the parking lot, hey, by the way, people are going to wave at you, you got to wave back. And you only do it with one finger or two fingers. And you know, there's no instruction. You just pick it up. So there is no introduction actually to the cheap weight. But here's where there is some introduction. There is a cool story behind why the Jeep wave exists. And I think that is important as to why it works and why it sticks. So really the Jeep was manufactured for World War II. And so they became manufactured in the US in 1941. And the wave, the, the, the myth is, if you will, that the wave started because when veterans came back, they would see each other on the road and they were the ones most inclined to buy Jeeps because they were manufactured for World War II. And so they would be the most, again, inclined to purchase Jeeps. So when they saw each other on the road, it was a way of acknowledging and recognizing one another. So the fact that they don't, there is no formal introduction that gets made when you're welcomed into the Jeep community is true. However, the story behind why that even exists, the Jeep wave, is solid and is good. So I'm going to equate it to an experience I had when working at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. I was an assistant director for Residence Life there, and I always remember the, I will never forget that the year that Miami was founded was 1809. And I won't forget it because they have on that campus the 1809 room. And it's a dining room. It's their fanciest, if you will, dining room. And they named it after, they named it the 1809 room, I think because they don't want people to forget the year that Miami was established, but it works. So what I would suggest to you and what I would say to you is that one of our tasks right now is to begin to think about if introduction is important to community, what am I formally doing? How am I formally creating introduction into what is going to be and look like a different kind of community than in the past? We don't want to just let it happen. Um, we want to be aware even though Jeep doesn't formally introduce it, there is a cool story that makes it hang together. So you're thinking about the introduction, the formal introduction that you are going to make to students who enter your community. The second thing is identity. Okay, the identity of Jeep is super strong. 
Uh, it's, you know, you don't even, I don't even have to say too much, right? It's rugged, it's adventurous, it's outdoorsy. I mean, the, the profile of a Jeep owner is very, very specific. So that's the next thing that we're really wanting to think about is what is the identity? How do we build and create a sense of identity when proximity is not working in our favor? So again, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what do I know? What is the sense of identity that I can create around our building or around our floor? Um, that is, again, the second thing to be thinking about. Um, interaction. That's the third one that I wanted to talk about. So interestingly enough regarding Jeep, the only interaction that they create is the wave. Really, I mean, now they do, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, they do have festivals, but again, the interaction is really reduced to a wave as you're passing. So this is very hopeful for us because our interaction is much limited. So if we're thinking to ourselves, well, how did, Jeep, how did that come to be? And, and while I might not copy the Jeep wave, because that wouldn't work, what is something that I could do that would uh, resemble, if you will, this concept of interaction, but be different and unique to my community. We're going to keep moving through all of these. And as we go through the entire analysis, I think you'll get additional ideas about what it is that we're saying here. Um, involvement. So this is really about making sure that there are opportunities for, in this case, Jeep owners to get involved um, with the experience. So what I will say is that because the community is so thriving, which really happened beginning with the, the simple waving, but because emergent from that is this thriving community, what has happened over time is that leaders have emerged to have helped plan Jeep festivals that happen all over the country. So I looked up many of them, but I, I have six or seven here that are really big and actually happen annually. So there's the Phantom Jeep Heritage Festival that happens in Pennsylvania and Easter Jeep Safari and Jeep Jamboree. I mean, there's many, many of them. So these are opportunities for people to actually involve themselves um, at a higher level. Then there's the issue of investment. Um, investment is, in this case, literal and figurative. So if there's one thing I know about Jeep owners is that there's no shortage of ways for them to invest in their Jeep. All sorts of swag, all sorts of cool features. So you get your Jeep, but then there's all kinds of things that you can do to it. This is another reason that the community of Jeep works, even though, again, there's really very little gathering in person that happens. It's because they've created something that I can continue to invest in in other ways as time goes on. So the investment is not just, again, in the physical Jeep itself, but it's also every time I invest in my Jeep, I get more connected to it. Every time I purchase something new for it, I get more connected to the, being a Jeep owner. And then the last piece uh, of the analysis, if you will, of this piece is influence. Um, you know, there are lots of ways that Jeep owners can influence the Jeep brand. One of them that I thought was really interesting is there's hashtag my Jeep story. And this is um, for a year, their 75th anniversary just passed. And for a year, they use that hashtag to collect thousands, more, more than that probably, hundreds of thousands of Jeep stories. And then they vetted through them. And at the end of it, they actually created a book um, of, of Jeep owner stories, uh, kind of the best of the best, if you will. Uh, this strikes me as, you know, the kind of thing where it would be very easy to create a floor hashtag or to collect stories, funny stories, you know, touching stories, whatever they are, and at the end of that, to compile it into some kind of keepsake. So again, just another example of the ability to influence. So what Miner and Schroeder basically are saying as it relates to these six I's is that when introduction, identity, interaction, involvement, investment, and influence are all accounted for within a community, when you create opportunity for all of those things to exist, that communities will thrive. And Jeep is an example of that. They, they without knowing it, without necessarily being intentional about checking each of those boxes, if you study Jeep, you will see that they have created all of that within the Jeep brand. 
So the second thing that I want to do it's in this analysis, if you will, is I want to talk about strange and bearings environment, uh, bannings environmental theory. So I want to look at Jeep through these four dimensions that strange and banning talk about. They basically, you know, are, are environmental theorists and they have um, kind of postulated that when we look at and analyze and study um, culture and environment, that we do it through these four lenses. So the first is physical, the physical space. What does it look like? Um, how does it cultivate community? How does it support and facilitate the building of community. If you were to read their works, you would see they talk about how wide staircases are and how far apart landing, I mean, landings are and green space on a college campus. I mean, there's much, much written about that. Interestingly enough, again, as it relates to Jeep, there is no physical, which is very hopeful and good for us because this is the, the piece of community building on college campuses in the fall that will be most challenged. So that's physical. Next is the human aggregate, and these are the dominant characteristics of the people within the environment. So this is where you are having to ask yourselves or have your staff ask themselves very real questions about, okay, what do we know about our human aggregate? Uh, what can we glean from them? I, I put this up here because I just thought this is a really good example of what I was saying earlier. Um, you know, there, this is a, a meme that was out there. There are two types of people in the world, people who love Jeeps and people who are wrong. But that just, I put that up there to say the identity, again, the identity, the human aggregate of the Jeep owner is very um, pronounced. And I think actually, if we think about our students the, in the macro against the backdrop of the larger, you know, kind of, uh, against the backdrop of the country, that we probably can find some very common themes, whether it's how tech savvy our students are and our ability to, you know, kind of plug into that. So you're looking for the broad stroke um, things that you can identify about your human aggregate that will help you build a sense of community and identity. The third is organizational. So these are the established plans, the rules and the guidelines for the group. These are decisions that get made um, uh, around this. Actually, that last one, I, I wonder if there's one more, let me check to see if there's a different, uh, yeah, okay, let's, let's talk about this one. So organizational is all about the policies, procedures, practices that we intentionally put in place in order to um, build community. So I wanna talk about Easter eggs. Uh, that's what these are called. So uh, Jeep puts in all their cars these Easter eggs. And what that just means is they're hi hidden animals that are featured throughout your Jeep. And you don't necessarily know where it is, but part of your job is to figure that out as, you're, as a Jeep owner. And so there's an entire community associated with this as well online. But the point is that what, when they do that, when they make a decision to do that, what they are actually doing is they are elevating your level of investment, uh, I, I'm sorry, the intensity of your involvement in their brand. Why? Because now you are exerting physical energy looking for it and psychological energy thinking about it. And so automatically what that's doing is elevating the intensity of your involvement with the Jeep brand. So it's a very simple thing that they do, and yet the impact of it is very, very high. Not only that, but then it becomes another source of people um, connecting around the Jeep brand online in various ways. So this is an example of something that your job really like today we're planting seeds your job is to be thinking about how what does that concept look like if i try to put it onto a residence hall floor or into a building how might i take that concept and work with it and play with it in my mind to actually create an experience that maybe elevates the level of intensity um, for the the members of community so the last is the constructed and the thing about constructed is it's the stuff that isn't gets said, that never gets said. It's never formally written. It's just generally understood. So there's a little bit of irony in even having a picture for this one because, of course, it's stuff that never gets said and it never gets written down. 
It's never formally done. And yet I'm showing you something that is formal. But the concept of the wave is completely constructed. It just gets passed from person to person to person, never formally being written, written down in any way. Now, what's interesting about it is that there is enough buy-in from the community members that it has been written down and now it is floating out there on the internet. So this is an example of what happens when investments and uh, it goes skyrockets for a particular brand or in our case, community. The other thing I'll say is that in addition to this, there's hierarchy. So if you were to Google this further, you would see that not all Jeeps are created equal. So there is hierarchy in terms of who initiates the wave. And basically, the more rugged and the dirtier the Jeep, the more other people are supposed to initiate the wave. In other words, you're so cool that you don't have to do it. Everybody should be waving at you kind of thing. So this is, um, again, if we were looking at strange and banning and environmental theory, they talk a lot about stratification within a community. That's an example of stratification, where even within a community, we have um, kind of order, if you will. Okay, last one. Let's look, let's just revisit the um, community connection model for a minute. Let's talk a little bit about um, some of these things that we've already said. So again, the Jeep experience is a perfect experience of something or a perfect example of something that is low intensity, but happening over a long period of time. I'm a Jeep owner. My husband's been a Jeep owner for his entire adult life. So his time frame is still going on, but his his time as a Jeep owner is never super intense. It comes down to waving at people on the road, possibly buying various Jeep swag at various points. So it's, again, low intensity, long period of time. But he would tell you that if you put a bunch of Jeep owners in a room, chances are they will bond and connect and have more in common from the get-go than most even of his, of his friends, really. Um, so very, very, uh, um, what do I want to say? Certainly impactful as it relates to build, to connecting people. Um, again, low intensity, short, long period of time. The other thing I wanted to say about that was just, again, the Jeep wave, uh, what is creating the intensity? So let's talk a little bit about that. I think it's things like the Jeep wave, the Easter eggs, the ability to purchase paraphernalia. These are all ways that they, and now if he were to, we've never been to a festival, but if we were to hop in our car and say, we're gonna go to the festival in Pennsylvania, this would be us exerting more energy, physical and psychological. And so that would create an even a more intense experience, possibly getting us even feeling more connected to the Jeep brand than it did originally. But um, the point there is just, how does Jeep successfully elevate the level of intensity of involvement? And that's how they do it, by putting things in place like the hidden Easter egg, like opportunities for you to buy swag, like the Easter eggs that are hidden, all examples of how they do that. Okay, now let's apply this to cards. Uh, I'm gonna talk about five cards, I think. I don't know exactly know how much time we have left, but I'm gonna hit five, um, hit five cards. And, um, and then we're gonna open it to Q&A. Hopefully, all of this is generating lots of questions, even if the questions are, what are you talking about? Um, okay, so let's talk about five cards. Um, this is where we're really gonna take the Jeep concept and we're gonna now move it over to our job, building community in our halls, even though COVID is significantly impacting the way that we go about doing that. So I pulled what I thought were five, or maybe I have six actually, six cards here that from the deck that I thought that you could um, look at and adapt to really respond to COVID-19. Now, let me just say a couple of things about this. We, as a general rule, when we're talking about the cards, we're saying, pull the cards and in any order and just apply them that way. And some campuses like to do it that way, just random. And other campuses like to actually be a little planful about the order in which they're going to pull the cards. There's not a right way to do it. It's just whatever works for you. We like the, the notion that they aren't super planned because we think that it can, um, it can impact 
the community in a more serendipitous way. But again, it isn't essential. So I, let me start with Innovate, actually, which is the last one. This one, this card was part of our booster pack. And we put it in there because there's a real acknowledgement that the workforce is looking for people who know how to innovate. And uh, so the example that we used, we gave multiple and, we, and we, we focused, interestingly enough, when we wrote this card, we focused on constraints as a form of generating innovation. So what we basically talked about is Dr. Seuss and how he wrote his books um, with 50 words or less. Or we talked about the fact that, um, uh, I think it's, who was uh, Jeff Bezos has a two pizza rule. So no team uh, can be bigger than you can feed with two pizzas. So these are constraints that are placed on organizations or on people in an effort to drive creativity and innovation. I'm picking this one first as the one to talk about because I actually think that this entire semester and maybe even year is an example of this. This, this is what we're asking you to do. This is what we're asking your staffs to do is to basically innovate around constraints. So how do you build community when you cannot fall back on some of your normal tried and true methods? And so what we should feel very good about as educators uh, and as leadership developers, what we should feel very good about is the idea that we are actually challenging students to do this in a real life way that will transcend their job as an RA and will give them something very real to talk about when they are job interviewing. So this is really drives at the why. Why is this so important that we help facilitate our staffs through this process. So it, again, drives at that, um, that issue of just innovation. The entire card is built around this, this moment. Um, okay, let's go back up to the top. Let's talk about resourcefulness. Um, this card, in its normal stance, challenges you to give, uh, or challenges RAs uh, to give one another a resource on campus, and then the RA is challenged to kind of use that resource, introduce that resource, um, into their community to see what value it might add. At any rate, uh, what I thought is that an expanded idea for this particular um, card this year could be doing what we're doing here today. So what would happen if we challenged our RAs each to find their own brand that they feel connected to, that they love, that they feel part of a community when they are engaged with it? How about if we had each of them do that and then do their own analysis of what it is about that brand that makes it work? Why does that community thrive even though we might not, we're not meeting on a regular basis perhaps, right? So I think that's a nice adaptation to that card for this particular semester or year. The next card is the commitment card. Um, this one is where we, you know, the challenge for this one was really getting students to, re to write a bumper sticker. And the example that we used was FedEx and how they, um, their bumper sticker is when it absolutely pos positively has to be on time. Uh, that's kind of their brand, when it absolutely positively has to be on time. And so our challenge to RAs during this particular, for this particular card was to create their own bumper sticker that said, when it absolutely positively has to be dot, dot, dot. It's getting the student to think about who they are, what their brand promise is, what their commitment is as a leader. So what I love about the, you know, adapting this one slightly is that it is actually asking them to rethink themselves as a leader, to, to recommit to a brand promise, if you will. So what would happen if they did reimagine themselves as leaders and answer that question when it absolutely possibly, positively has to be blah, blah. What would they add to that? And what reflection would that be on their brand as a leader, as a leader and community builder during this time? The third was rituals and traditions. In the card that comes with the 
uh, the basic model. We talk about Alabama, the football team, and the ticker tape over the telephone wire uh, as a way that they celebrate when they win a game. And what we, and that's, you know, obviously a great example of a ritual and tradition that they're very proud of. Uh, but in the absence of sharing physical space, in the absence of even having football games this semester, the challenge here is what ritual, or can, uh, what, what ritual can we create that um, would not require people to be in, in person? Two things that immediately came to mind for me around this one is when I was working at SMU many years ago in the, cafe, in the um, little market downstairs in the student center, there, was, uh, there, were, there were numbers all over the floor. And at 10, 12, and two, because we lived near a um, Dr. Pepper uh, manufacturing plant, at 10, 12, and two, the idea was you were supposed to go down to the market stand on a number and there would be giveaways that would happen at each of those hours. Now, in theory, this is Dr. Pepper trying to, trying to get you to take a break at 10, 12, and 2 and um, to drink a Dr. Pepper. But it was a great community gatherer and it was a great example of a daily ritual that occurred in the building. Some days I would go, some days I wouldn't go, sometimes I'd be in a meeting, sometimes I wouldn't be in a meeting. It, but the idea is that because it was there all the time, you could choose to participate in it or not. Um, so again, just a simple example. Another one is when I was at the University of Georgia, there was a staff person there, uh, a guy, and he worked in, my, in the same leadership office that I worked in, and he had what he called bow tie Wednesday. Now, this was, again, very emergent. It was not planned. It was not a thing. It was, you know, it was just his own emergent tradition uh, and ritual. But he, by the end of the, by the end of, by the time I left, he probably had 60 guys on campus who every Wednesday would wear a bow tie. And they just called it Bowtie Wednesday. And that was it. So it's a very simple tradition that really created a strong sense of connection and identity among males on the campus. And it was emergent, which really made it beautiful. So this is, again, challenging our staffs to think about what rituals and traditions they can put in place that are not bound by space, physical space, but more by maybe a connection uh, uh, in another way. And these are all examples of low intensity, long period of time. Okay, uh, adaptability. The, this was really challenging. This card challenges them normally when we use it in its intended way to look at to nature for insight into how they can um, either alter their behavior or on the floor. So what new thing can you do to your floor or how might you grow as a person if you were to look to nature for a lesson? Uh, I think the same thing is true. How can we look to nature for, for solutions and answers to this challenge that we have before us about what we might do? And at the time that I was thinking about this, I was, just got back from Florida yesterday or the day before, and I, in the house that we were staying at, there's a dove nest on top of the fan, so we couldn't turn it on. It was out on the porch. And what we learned and realized, we looked at, ended up looking it up, but what we learned is that the doves never leave, obviously, I mean, they're incubating the nest. So, so the male and the female would rotate in a, in a kind of 12 hour shift, but one of them would always be sitting on top. Uh, and so I, I began to think to myself, well, what, what, would that, what could that teach me? What could I glean from that? And so it got me thinking about, well, what would happen if, if you know, there was somebody watching over our community at all times, like 24 hours a day, what would that look like? How could I create that? What, how would I have to use social media or um, hashtags? Or what would I, how, would, how would I have to deploy my residents if I wanted to create a sense of community that just was day and night? So of course, it requires more thinking, but just that's the concept. And the last one is surprise. Um, just the, the value of surprise and what it can bring to community. And all I'll say about that so that we leave time for questions is, um, uh, is the Easter eggs are great, a great example. So you put Easter eggs in a Jeep and all of a sudden there's an elevated sense of um, uh, excitement and energy and curiosity. Okay, so those are examples. Uh, that's kind of, if you will, our analysis and then the analysis applied to the, the basic deck of cards in terms of how you might think about how to build community despite the fact that you do not have physical space on your side.
We don't have any questions. I'll give some time for some to come in because people might have some. Uh, however, Elizabeth did comment to say that the spider is in her gas tank area. Ah, nice. Yes. Okay. I wonder how many Jeep owners we have out there. Ooh. They can do the raise hand function if they want to let us know that they have a Jeep. Yeah. Or if they would add anything based on their Jeep ownership. We have two Jeep owners out there, it appears. Okay. All right, well, there aren't any out there, but I know that one question we often receive, Claudia, is this is great, but if my campus isn't currently using BASIC, how do I find it? How do I get access to it? Yeah, so you can go to a Kualize website. So the question was, if, 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 if my campus doesn't use BASIC, but I'm curious to learn more, what would I do? And so a, a Kuhawai's website has it for sale. Uh, you can buy the deck of cards. You can buy the booster pack. You can, you know, that's a good way to experiment with the concept before jumping in to the entire, uh, if you will, model itself. And again, it's all online. No questions. Okay. No questions. That's... Questions are good. Questions. <laughs> All right. No questions. Then if there are no questions, uh, our contact information is there. So you can reach out to either one of us. Uh, Dee could not be on the call today. But if, again, just feel free to reach out to any one of us via our email addresses. And we can certainly get back to you if you think of something after the, after the fact. So thank you so much for joining us.